Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Rothenberg, the president of the International Eosinophil Society, and I'm very pleased to welcome you today in our seminar entitled Eosinophil Gastrointestinal Diseases, or EGITS. Little information about our society. The International Eosinophil Society is an organization of scientists and clinicians interested in the eosinophil, a cell strongly associated with many diseases. The society sponsors biennial meetings, monthly webinars, and other educational programming for its over than 300 members. We substantially review the literature, new information about eosinophils, and their role in health and disease. If you're interested in becoming a member of our society or joining the email list, I encourage you to visit our website. You can also scan the QR code shown. We're very pleased to offer free membership for early career individuals. This includes all students, healthcare personnel, doctorate candidates, postdocs, and fellows. We're also pleased to announce that we are offering soon joint membership with the European Mass Cell Baseball Research Network. We're also now currently conducting medical journal reviews about critical articles that come to our attention in the field of eosinophil biology. These articles are um, selected by our scientists and clinicians, and they're reviewed. We certainly take nominations for articles. If you know of any coming up or you have any of your own that you'd like to bring to our attention, you can also check this out with the VR code shown. I wanted to alert you to our upcoming exciting meeting this July of 2025, 2025 in Montpellier, France. Program is extraordinary. We're looking forward to hosting this meeting and encourage you to visit our website to get more information and register early. Next uh, webinar will be in October on the 16th, and we're pleased to have it focused on a Lifetime Achievement Award, celebrating the legacy of Dr. Professor Gerald Gleick. The webinar will feature other key speakers that have trained with Dr. Gleick over the years, and they're shown in this slide. Please register now for this very exciting, honorable um, event on behalf of Dr. Gleick's critical contribution to our field. I want to thank our sponsors, Sanofi and Regeneron, particularly for today's webinar support. I'd also like to acknowledge our Corporate Advisory Council and the companies shown here at the various levels in which they're supporting the society. Today, I'll be moderating this session along with Dr. Samin Zhang, who will be co-moderating. Dr. Zhang will now um, take over and tell you more about what's going to happen today and introduce the first speaker. Samin? Good morning, everyone. I'd like to remind you to use the question and answer button to ask questions anytime during each presentation. Moderators will read questions to the speakers. All attendees are muted and the chat feature is disabled. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the IES website in English. Additionally, you can view closed captioning or live transcription during the webinar by clicking the Show Captions button. We have a very exciting lineup of speakers today, and it is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Jia Rei Ding, uh, on his talk on the EOE Cell Atlas. Uh, Dr. Ding is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. He is a Canada Research Chair in Machine Learning and Single Cell Analysis. He received his PhD from UBC in 2016 under the guidance of Dr. Saurabh Shah and Ann Condon. And uh, from 2017 to 2021, he performed postdoctoral training under Dr. Aviv Rajev at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. His lab develops interpretable machine learning models and efficient inference algorithms for multimodality data analysis to elucidate the cellular and molecular features in tissue homeostasis and inflammation. 
and to help to reveal the general principles of tissue cellular organization. Dr. Ding. Okay, so uh, first, let me share my screen. Um, sorry, can you see my screen? There seem to be some problems. Wait a minute. Um, you can see it, but not your presentation. Yes. Um, I think I saw the uh, same problems. Sorry. Um, it's here. Wait, it is sank. Now it's here. Sorry. So, can you see my slides now? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. So, um, first, I'd like to thank uh, Simin for the really nice introduction. I also want to uh, thank Mark for the invitation. So, so for giving me the opportunity to talk about our recent work and the human esophageal mucosa cell outness. So before I get, I get, um, get started, I want to thank my advisors and uh, collaborators and also people from the different groups. So they contribute to this uh, work and also the funding agencies. And uh, of course, the patient who donate their tissue samples so we can do this research. Okay, so um, here is the study design of our, um, our, our work. And you can see we connected tissue samples from uh, 22 patients. Uh, eight patients are in active EOE. By the way, EOE are um, eosinophilic esophagitis, which is a chronic inflammatory disease of the human esophagus. So we connected tissue samples from eight patients in active EOE and seven patients in remission, and uh, seven patients, uh, seven healthy individuals uh, whose esophagus just looks like normal. And then uh, for 15 patients, we connected the samples from the both the uh, proximal and also the distal regions. So in total, we connected 37 patient biopsies from 22 patient donors. So we connected this tissue um, in the Massachusetts General Hospital and then sent to the um, Broad Institute for um, Single Cell Library Preparation using the 10x chromium platform. Um, and then uh, these libraries were sequenced by uh, Unumina uh, high sig machines. So here is an overview of all the data we have. Um, so here each dot represents a cell colored by cell states. Um, because these are pretty high dimensional data, we project this data into a sphere. So to interpret this data, you want to see we want to see um, so the left and also on the right, basically they are connected. So we have lots of epithelial cells, uh, maybe more than um, fifty percent, and also a small number of B cells, um, mostly uh, plasma B cells and memory B cells, and also uh, stroma cells, including. Uh, such as the fibroblasts, endocinia cells, and also parasites, man cells, and cyclic man cells, lots of T cells, NK cells, and also ILC, uh, innate nephrotic cells, uh, monocytes, macrophages, and DCs, um, of course, uh, eosinophils. So in total, we connected about 400,000 cells, uh, including 60 cell states, um, um, 70, uh, 11. Um, subset are cycling cell states. So you can look and you can browse and download our data from here. And also you can download the FASCO files from, um, uh, you can get the, uh, the, uh, the information from the paper. So let's first look at the eosinophils. So compared to other uh, granulocytes such as mast cells and also um, neutrophils and also related to cell types such as ILC2s and TH2 cells, 
these uh, eosinophils express the MHC2 MHC class 2 genes, such as HGLE DRA. So we see the same pattern across um, uh, different data sets, such as EOE4 from uh, this study. Uh, so uh, let's um, just look at the different cell subsets um, in more detail. So we first look at man cells because these cells are known to be important for food energy. We talk about their recruitment, activation, and also heterogeneity. So these are all the man cells we get. Uh, we just use this cell in this U map as again. So uh, each dot represents a cell. So as you can see, we have both man cells and also these secondary man cells. On the right, we just show this um, man cells colored by the disease status. And you can see the uh, cells from health individuals and also the remission patients that are kind of uh, close by. Well, for the uh, secondary cells, and then they're mostly enriched in the patients from active EOE. Uh, in total, we get 28,925 cells in total. Um, mass cells. Uh, these, uh, these cells account for 7.35% of all the recovered cells. So we next quantify the cellular compositional change in uh, different disease conditions. So let's first look at the mass cells and you can see, so here each dot represents a uh, tissue biopsy. So the green color represents uh, health, and then blue represents uh, remission, and the red represents uh, active EOE. So we can see, um, so the cells, the uh, percentage of mass cells just increase from healthy to remission and then to active EOE. So for the eosinophils and the second mass cells, so they are, uh, we can see some pretty similar pattern, but slightly different. So in healthy and uh, remission, so there are not much of these cells, but in active EOE, so the percentage of these cells just increase. Uh, because mast cells in healthy uh, um, e, um, patients, so they're mostly in the lamina propria, and then the active EOE, they just migrate to the um, uh, epithelium. So we want to ask which kind of molecules could help to recruit these mast cells to the epithelium. So there could be several. So we focus on the KIT and the KIT ligate here, because this is an important uh, growth factor and also a chemotractant for uh, mast cells. We found the epithelial cell, especially the not fully differentiated um, um, epithelial cell, including the basal cells, second basal cells, and also the super basal cells. And you can see active EOE, and then these cells uh, upregulate the KITLG uh, compared to the man cells uh, from either uh, remission or health individuals. Well, for the uh, fully differentiated apic cells, so there is no much difference. Um, in terms of the KIT, KIT negative expression. Um, for mast cells, because we know that the uh, expressed IG receptors, um, uh, so here FCR1A and FCR1G and also MS4A2. So we can see their expression um, uh, across different data sets. So in terms of B cells, we found the uh, IG positive B cells so the, uh, these cells are enriched in the patients in active EOE compared to the um, B cells from uh, healthy individuals. Similarly, we can see the uh, mast cells from remission patients, they also uh, enriched in IG positive B cells. So next to test whether um, these uh, B cells from active EOE patients show some IG mediated activation. So we use a gene signature from um, Man cells treated with IgE plus anti-IgE uh, treatments, and then these genes are upregulated. So this gene signature includes about uh, 80 genes from this study. So we use gene signature to score the mast cells from our study. And you can see here, so the mast cells from the uh, active EOE patients upregulate this gene signature compared to the mast cells from healthy individuals. We can see kind of consistent results um, for the last one, this is from another platform, uh, the sequoia, and also this is from pediatric patients. So um, we can see some, um, there is a significant difference for the mast cells from active EOE and the remission EOE. 
We also did a differential expression analysis between the man cells from uh, active VOE patients and also healthy individuals. And then we identified 95 genes. Uh, these genes are enriched in uh, several CAC pathways, such as FC, epsilon RNA signaling pathway or uh, plant net activation. We also use this 95 gene signature to score the mass cells from our study. So as you can see here, we can see a, um, a increase of this gene signature score from healthy to remission to active. So this is consistent from different studies. So as for mast cell heterogeneity, we found a group of mast cells. So they express the MHC class two genes such as HLA-DRA, and a small number of uh, mast cells express the interferon gamma, uh, the interferon response genes. Okay, so uh, now let's um, go to look at the uh, other minority cells such as the macrophage and D6. So this is a pretty rare. So uh, they just account for about 1.65% of all the recovered cells. Uh, we first did a pseudo bug analysis, basically for each cell, uh, cell type, and then we just uh, add the cells for each cell type, and then to create pseudo bug, and then after that we normalize the pseudo bug, and then do um, PC analyze, and then we uh, next do hierarchical clustering, and you can see the uh, DCs are grouped together, and the monocytes are here, and also the macrophages are here. So this is as, as expected. So maybe indicate our analyze are um, good enough. Okay. We also uh, quantify the cellular compositional change uh, in disease. So here we focus on two cell, two type of cells. The first one we call the ALOX15 macrophages. And you can see uh, these cells they also increase um, in active EOE compared to uh, remission EOE and also healthy individuals. Another one is the, we call CDC2C, which is a novo DC subset which uh, this cell express PRDM16. So for the ANOX50 macrophage, so these cells express the um, marker gene ANOX15. So uh, this, um, the expression of ANOX15 in macrophage can be induced by IO4 and IO13 uh, as expected. So the ANOX15 expression are mostly for, the, for these ma uh, macrophages from active UE patients. So we did differential expression analysis between these macrophages and also the other macrophages combined. So uh, you can see we detected several uh, a set of genes such as CPSB, ENOX15 is here, and also uh, such as MMP12 and MMP9. Uh, because these cells are still uh, quite rare, so we did another kind of independent analysis or orthogonal analysis. We didn't do clustering, but just do a non-negative matrix factorization to extract gene signature. So we found the gene signature basically consists of these cells such as ALOX15, MMP12, or MMP9. So as you can see the ALOX15 uh, macrophages are high, um, have high uh, signature, gene signature score for, for, uh, for these cells, for these genes. So that means we can kind of detect these uh, ALOX15 macrophages from different uh, kind of analyze. So this signal is pretty strong. So for the ANOX15, um, they can act uh, they can act on the um, epithelial cells to maybe to promote uh, tissue um, remodeling. So this, uh, this gene is also expressed in other cell types such as superbasal cells and also eosinophils. If we just look at the uh, expression of this gene, we can, uh, we can separate uh, the, um, the tissue from healthy individuals and, uh, um, and the EOE patients. Uh, so based on just based on bulk RNA-seq data. Okay, let's go to look at the uh, PRDM16 uh, DCs. So this, uh, this is a novel DC, and then they express the DC marker genes, such as the um, MHC class two genes. They also express a set of novel marker genes, such as PRDM16, ROC, and PIGR. 
uh, we found these disease from uh, other tissues and other studies as well, such as from this uh, brain study to study the uh, glioblastoma, which is a brain tumor. And also from two uh, cross tissue immune cell studies, such as terminal sapiens and cross immune cells, um, and also from the colon, because these are pretty rare cell types. So uh, you need to sequence a lot of cells to, uh, to um, find these cells. Uh, although we don't um, uh, know how, so the function of these uh, cells in, in the setting of EOE, there are some recent studies such as uh, just posted uh, about two months ago. So they see this, they call this ROGAMA-T dependent antigen presenting cells. Basically, these are the, uh, basically these are the same set of cells and then they regulate uh, the um, T-Rex. Okay. Uh, next, we uh, look at the T cells, NK, and IOCs. So for these cells, we also first do uh, to create uh, pseudobug, and then uh, after that, we normalize the pseudobug and then project this data into the first PC. And you can see, so sorry, so the uh, second cells are in this region, and then the CD4 T cells are here, and the CD8 T cells are here, and also uh, NK cells and also other IOCs. Uh, importantly, we see the ILC2 is here. Uh, so we know that the ILC2 and TH2 cells they, uh, have some similar functions. So, and then both are increased uh, or increase their proportion in active EOE compared to uh, healthy uh, individuals. Well, for TH17 cells, so this cells just decrease in their, uh, in their uh, proportion in active EOE compared to uh, healthy individuals. Um, because ILC2s and TH2 cells, they have similar functions, um, and we want to see uh, their difference. So we uh, did differential expression analysis between the ILC2s and TH2 cells. So uh, you can see here, so the ILC2s operate a set of genes such as PDGS2, uh, PDGDR2, and also CTS, uh, CTSW, which is also expressed in CDT cells and AREG, and also uh, this uh, IL-13-3 receptor, IL-1 or IL-1. While for IL-13, there is no much difference between these two uh, cell types. While for IL-5, it is more uh, expressed in TH2 cells. Uh, although this ILC2 is pretty rare, so we, uh, in total, I think we um, identified about 100 cells. Um, but we um, found these cells from different st studies, such as from this EOE4, based on marker genes such as PDGS2 and other marker genes. Uh, in terms of the cytokines, um, we look at IL4, 5, 9, and IL13. You can see for TH2 cells, they express IL4, IL5, and also IL13. Uh, although IL9 is mostly undetec undetectable, for uh, ILC2, they also express IL13, uh, also IL5, but um, at a lower level. For uh, mast cells, are also interesting, and you can see they express uh, IL4, IL5, and also IL13. So, they, so these cells could have some um, redundant uh, functions in the setting of EOE. Um, now for TH17 cells, we uh, before we see that they just decrease in their senior composition or, or their proportion in active EOE. Uh, importantly, we also see these cells they just decrease they produce less cytokines in active EOE compared to health. Okay, now uh, let's look at the structure cells, especially the uh, fibroblasts. So we first uh, did differential expression analysis between the fibroblasts from active UE patients and then the healthy individuals. And then we found a set of genes. Some of these genes are known to be um, upregulated in active UE, such as Poston or um, TGM2. Um, the important is this IL-30RA2. So this is the uh, IL-13 DEC receptor. We just show the same results in uh, using this varying plot. And then we can clearly see the operation of this IL-13-RA2 in active EOE compared to this healthy individual. So uh, so uh, because of this marker genes, so this um, 
Mass, they, uh, these uh, fibroblasts from active VOE patients are pretty similar to the so-called the inflammatory fibroblasts from, um, from colon IBD um, published several years ago. Uh, this IL-30RA2 is mostly expressed in uh, fibroblasts, you can see here. Um, we uh, finally did a uh, correlation analysis between the first PC, which basically captures the severity of the disease. So if the first PC is pretty um, is small, that means this, so here each dot represents a tissue biopsy. So that means the tissue biopsy is mostly from the healthy individuals or some uh, remission patients. When the first PC is high, then this, um, Tissue biopsies are mostly from um, active VOE patients. So you can see the first PC, uh, the correlation between the first PC and the function of this IL-13 RA2 fibroblast compared to the um, detected uh, fibroblast for each uh, tissue biopsy. So for the healthy and remission, we didn't see much correlation. Only for active VOE, we see uh, a high correlation between the first PC and also the uh, Function of IL-30 RA2 uh, fibroblasts. Okay, so uh, finally, in summary, so uh, we built a esophageal mucosa single cell atlas with about 400,000 cells from 37 patient biopsies with 60 cell states, including 11 second states. Although we didn't identify um, such a neutrophils or uh, basophils for different reasons. So we analyzed mass, mass cells recruitment, activation, and uh, heterogeneity. And then we identified disease-associated Linux 50 macrophages and also novel PRDM16 disease. We identified rare IOC2s and diminished TH17 cells in active VOE. And then we uh, identified IL-13 RA2 inflammatory fibroblasts enriched in active VOE. So this is my uh, last slide. Um, Thanks, and I'd like to take any questions the audience may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Ding. There are two questions that, uh, in the chat. Uh, the first question is how much lamina propria tissue was included with your biopsies or were they mostly epithelial above the basement membrane? Uh, that's a really uh, great question. So we do think the um, our tissue is pretty gentle. We didn't get so much lamina propria. So that's why we didn't see lots of such as the um, uh, endocinia cells or fibroblasts. So, but we do uh, get some of those. Uh, another question is, uh, what is known about these remission samples? Were these patients on swallowed steroids, elimination therapy, and uh, how do you think treatment would impact normalization of the signature? Uh, that's also a good question. Uh, yeah, so we do uh, have the uh, some treatment of uh, um, uh, information about these patients. I think many of these patients are could in um, in um, in um, diet elimination or other treatments. I don't think they are uh, receiving um, such an um, the as the, uh, the IL4 and IL13 inhibitor, but they, we do have those uh, information. The problem is that we don't have many patients, just 22. So it's really hard to, to, um, to um, yeah, to stratify these patients for much more detailed analysis. I think the uh, the treatment information or the meta information is the in the supplementary table one of our paper. So you can refer those for uh, more details. And another question: uh, At which stage of disease were these samples obtained? Um, was it at the onset of um, EOE or at a later stage? Um, so for, um, I think for these patient biopsies, we do um, have those from either um, active EOE patients or remission patients. Uh, I think many of these patients have already have EOE um, for many years. This is based on my uh, understanding. Thanks for the question. Uh, and uh, uh, there's another question. Uh, did any of these patients also have asthma? And if so, how did the cell profile compare? Um, 
I think so. Some of these patients, they do have asthma, but we didn't um, specifically to do, to stratify these patients to see there are such as their cellular composition difference for these patients also has um, have asthma. So, but I think that's a really good question to see um, because these two diseases are kind of have some similar um, kind of, uh, similar also maybe. Um, I think the EOE called something the asthma of the esophagus. So, thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to uh, turn it over to Dr. Rothenberg for the second speaker. Thanks, Samin. It was a great talk. Um, looking forward to um, hearing more of your lab from your lab, Dr. Ding. And I just wanted to let everyone know that Dr. Samin Zhang, who's the co-moderator today, is an assistant professor at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. Uh, she's a colleague of mine, and I'm pleased um, to have her joining today as a co-moderator. Now I'm be very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Kelly Whalen, to talk about the differentiation of agents and drivers of disease. By way of background, Dr. Whalen is a native of Philadelphia, she received her BA from the Rosemont College and a PhD from Drexel University before pursuing her postdoctorate training with Dr. Neil Ruski and Hiroshi Nagagawa in the GI division at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Whalen joined Temple University as a tenure track assistant professor in 2017. She's working in the Department of Cancer and Cellular Biology, where she's developed a research program exploring the mechanisms of homeostasis in the esophagus and how these go array in widely prevalent esophageal diseases, including eosinophilic esophagitis. Dr. Whalen's research has been funded by the NIH and the Department of Defense, and it has, she has more than 50 publications in journals, including Nature Communication. It's a pleasure to have us speak today. Kelly, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Dr. Rothenberg, for that kind introduction. I am going to share my screen, which I believe you all can see at this point. And so today I was asked to talk about differentiation of aegids and drivers of disease. And what I like to convince you of is that there's a potential role for mitochondria in terms of the differentiation and driving at least of eosinophilic esophagitis. So how did we kind of get into mitochondria in the context of EOE? Um, our interest actually stemmed from a paper from the Rothenberg group um, that had performed whole exome sequencing and really provided the first data to suggest that mitochondria may be a factor in the pathogenesis of EOE. So I'm going to briefly review some of the data from this paper and then tell you how our lab has built on those studies. So in this paper, there was whole exome sequencing performed of 63 EOE patients and 60 unaffected family members. And then variants were determined, both rare variants and compound heterozygous variants. So in terms of what all of this means for mitochondria, one of the variants that came out of interest in this particular study um, was a variant in the gene DHTKD1 which encodes dehydrogenase E1 and transketylase transketylase demeaning containing one. So this is a gene that was of interest. And you can see here, you have the gene and there is this change from a C to a T residue at your R gene 834. So what, why was this particular gene of interest? Because when you looked at this one family of EOE patients, that showed an autosomal dominant pattern of EOE inheritance. So you're looking at the two parents here. In the dark, you have the affected individual, one of the parents, and you can see that all of the three offspring are affected, where your um, parent here, the unaffected parent, and here you have a C to T change that's happening. And that is occurring also in all of the three offspring that we're looking at. So this autosomal, dom autosomal, autosomal dominant pattern was suggesting that there may be causal variants that could be contributing to EOE that's occurring in this particular family. And one of the variants that was found was this variant in DHTKD1. So what is DHTKD1? This is a protein that is encoded in the nuclear DNA, and it encodes for a protein that is involved in mitochondrial lysine metabolism. So what you're looking at here is just a stock image. I think it's from Thermo Fisher. 
Um, where, but you can see in green, this is the staining for DHTKD1. And you can clearly see this is where mitochondria would be localized, perinuclear localization or mitochondria. So this was an interesting finding and they wanted to validate that DHTKD1 expression was indeed depleted in the family that they were interested in this particular study. And I think you can appreciate that very nicely here in this immunohistochemistry. So in our normal subject, it's a representative subject, you can see the brown stain is going to be for DHT, KD1. We see that it's primarily localized to the basal cell compartment. And um, in this active patient from that family, there is no significant change for, in fact, there may be a decrease in the level of DHT, KD1 compared to normal. Certainly, if we look at it compared to a non-familial active EOE case, it's clear that there is a very stark difference where you have upregulation in the active non-familial patient, whereas not in this uh, family member here. So the group then went on to look at the effects. So what's the function, functional role of DHTK1 potentially in terms of eosinophilic esophagitis? And to do that, they wanted to determine what happens if you knock that down. So this was done in esophageal epithelial cells, and you can see that you're going to have a decrease in the um, oxidative phosphorylation that's happening across the mitochondria at all, basal level ATP production, and in terms of maximal respiration as well. You also, in these patients, are seeing, I'm sorry, in these cells which have depleted levels of DHT, KD1, are seeing an increase in oxidative stress as represented by H2O2 production. So again, this study was a sort of jumping off point for our group in that it provided the first evidence mitochondria may be involved in the pathogenesis of EOE. But what we became pretty intrigued by was looking at this immunohistochemistry and, and having the question of, okay, so mitochondria may play a role in this particular family that we're looking at here in terms of its dysfunction and pathogenesis, but is it playing a broader role? Is the organelle playing a broader role in the... Um, more broad EOE pool. And we got some evidence from the paper that might be the case. So here, if you look at the expression of DHT KD1, you'll see that in this group of EOE patients, so not just one, we have several here, that there's an increase in the levels of DHT KD1 where you don't see that in the familial cases of EOE. And so our group wanted to look again at this broader pool of EOE patients and what might mitochondria be doing there. And so to start our studies, we did immunohistochemistry for another protein that is associated with mitochondria. Here, we're looking at mitochondrial encoded cytochrome oxidase, cytochrome C oxidase 1 or MTCO1. So this is a um, protein that is encoded by a gene in the mitochondrial DNA, but is incorporated into the, and is incorporated into the mitochondria. And I think, again, it's evident here that if we look at the normal as compared to active EOE, there's a dramatic increase in the staining for MTCO1, suggesting that there's at least more of this mitochondrial protein in the context of EOE patients and consistent with that study from the Rothenberg group. We also do see that the level of mitochondrial, um, this mitochondrial protein is decreased in our inactive EOE patients. Someone should mute. Thank you. And so that's just, again, looking at one patient there. We did this in a group of patients. So we have about 50 patients here. And you can see that this increase in MTCO1 score based on IHC was increased in a significant number of our active EOE patients um, compared to both normal and our inactive groups. So this is supporting that idea that there might be more mitochondria in the context of EOE patients. And we then wanted to determine what the signals might be that are causing that increase in mitochondria. And so the first thing that we thought of is that there may be a signal from the um, inflammatory milieu that's acting on the epithelium to cause this increase in mitochondria. So to test that, we moved into an in vitro system where we took our EPC2H TERT cells. So these are going to be the cell lines that I'm going to use throughout the study. Um, we immortalize, these are immortalized human esophageal keratinocytes, so they're normal. We um, looked at what happens if we treat with a panel of EOE relevant cytokines. So you can see here we have TH2 cytokines, TNF alpha, and also IL1 beta as well. And interestingly, 
When we treated these cells for seven days with these cytokines, we only saw a significant increase in the level of mitochondrial DNA in the context of IL-13. So I'm going to walk you through this because there are a lot of bars here. But basically, what we're looking at are three different genes, mtc one and ND6, which are going to be encoded in the mitochondrial DNA. We're also looking at COX-4 here. COX-4 is encoded by the nuclear DNA, but it encodes for a protein that is a mitochondrial protein. And we've normalized everything to gap DHSR control here. One thing I want to point your attention to is that the levels of COX-4, again, that gene that is encoded in the nuclear DNA, doesn't change. So if we look at this in our white bar, we don't see any increase in that with any of these cytokines, which is to be expected. Again, this is encoded in the nuclear DNA. We don't expect any genetic instability in the context of exposure to these particular cytokines, or in fact, in EOE patients is another um, interest of my, my group. Um, but what we do see is if you look at the black bar, which is looking at MTCO1 and the gray bar, ND6, so again, these are going to be mitochondrial encoded genes, there is an increase, again, specifically with IL-13 that is significant. We do see a slight bump with IL-4, but it didn't come to the level of significance. So from this, we're concluding that IL-13 is promoting mitochondrial DNA accumulation in esophageal keratinocytes in vitro. We also wanted to look at mitochondria. So you can see more mitochondrial protein, more mitochondrial DNA, but it doesn't necessarily mean there are more mitochondria. There could just be the same number of mitochondria with more DNA or with more of those proteins. Um, so to look at this, we used MitoTracker Green, which is a dye that's going to stain for mitochondria. And we took our, again, EPC2, HTERT cells and treated them with IL-13. And we did see a significant increase in the number of mitochondria, suggesting that this isn't just a change in the proteins or the DNA in the mitochondria, but actually IL-13 is causing an accumulation of mitochondria in esophageal epithelial cells. We then continued to evaluate the levels of mitochondria in the cell culture medium. So you may be thinking, well, why would you do that? Mitochondria is an organelle that's in the cell. Um, but mitochondrial DNA release from cells has been shown to be involved in promoting inflammatory signaling. So we wanted to know if perhaps that was also occurring in our esophageal epithelial cells upon exposure to EOE relevant cues. And so to do this, we were looking at the level of a different mitochondrial gene here, it's just ND1. We've looked at several, this is the example I'm showing you. Treated our cells, our EPC2H TERT cells with our panel of EOE relevant cytokines and took the culture medium and looked at the absolute copy number of ND1. And what you can see is that both IL-4 and IL-13 here is causing accumulation of mitochondrial DNA in the cell culture medium. So what IL-13 is driving this increase specifically in the cells themselves, the esophageal epithelial cells, IL-4 and IL-13 are both allowing for mitochondria to be, we say released here. What I can tell you is this isn't just an apoptotic effect, um, but we don't know how mitochondria are getting inside of the cell yet. We also wanted to go back to our patients and determine whether there might be mitochondria that is cell-free in the patients as well. So we collaborated with Amanda Muir's group at CHOP, who you'll hear from in the next talk, and looked at a group of um, 64 active EOE patients and 49 um, what we call normal patients here. So no GI conditions, no history of EOE. And we took their serum and looked for the expression again of several mitochondrial genes. I'm showing you ND1 here. And there was a significant increase in the absolute copy number of ND1 in our active EOE cohort. And so when I saw this, I was like, oh, this can be a great biomarker. One problem, though, is right, we're going to have some overlap that's occurring here. But I still think it's important to understand what's happening in this group of patients that does. So the subset of EOE patients that does have an increase in their level of circulating mitochondrial DNA, could that be useful for monitoring patients in response to specific therapies? And that's something that we're actively exploring right now. So what have I told you? We think that in response to EOE inflammatory cues, particularly IL-4 and IL-13, esophageal epithelial cells are showing changes in mitochondria, with IL-13 driving the increase in the cells, and both IL-13 and IL-4 allowing for the increase 
outside of themselves. And I think that draws two very simple questions. One being, what are the mechanisms that regulate these changes in mitochondria in esophageal epithelial cells? And the second being, are these changes at all relevant to the pathogenesis of EOE? And so I'm going to walk you through some of the data briefly that we have in terms of each of these questions. So in terms of the first question, what are the mechanisms that are regulating an increase in mitochondria and esophageal epithelial cells when they respond to IL-4 and IL-13? The first thing that we decided to look at was the JAK-STAT signaling pathway. So we know that IL-4 and IL-13 are going to signal through this IL-4 receptor alpha, and they can activate STAT signaling, including STAT-6, which has been shown, including by people on this call today, to be very much involved in the pathogenesis of EOE through transcriptional upregulations of the genes that you see listed here. So we wanted to know what happens if we block JAK-STAT signaling and look at the effects of IL-13 and IL-4 on mitochondria. So in this example here, we are looking at cells that have been treated, our EPC2H TERT cells, that have been treated with ruxolitinib, which is going to inhibit JAK-STAT signaling. We are then looking inside the cells at our levels of MTCO1 and ND6, those mitochondrially encoded genes, also COX-4, so our nuclear encoded gene. COX-4 doesn't change very nice as we expect, there's no significant difference. Again, if we treat with IL-13, our esophageal epithelial cells show a nice induction of both MTCO1 and ND6, indicating an increase in mitochondrial DNA. With ruxolitinib alone, we don't really see any difference compared to vehicle. Um, however, if we look at our cells treated with IL-13 and ruxolitinib in combination, there is a suppression of this increase that IL-13 mediates in terms of an increase in mitochondrial DNA, suggesting that JAK-STAT signaling is involved here. We wanted to then look at this in the context of our um, mitochondria outside of the cell as well. So here we took our cells and we again treated them with ruxolitinib and we are looking at the effects of IL-4 and IL-13. And we can see that both of these are increasing the mitochondria in the cell culture media and that's what we're looking at here, not in the cell, but in the media, looking at mitochondrial release. Um, the combination of IL-4 and IL-13 doesn't seem to do anything additive here, but with ruxolitinib, we're able to suppress the release of mitochondria in response to both IL-4 and IL-13. So what are the mechanisms regulating these changes in mitochondria? We think that JAT-STAT signaling is involved. And as we move forward, we are trying to determine how stat signaling could potentially be doing this. So I'd mentioned stat six um, as something that we know plays a critical role in EOE pathogenesis. Our lab's also interested in looking at stat three, which has recently emerged as a potential player in EOE as well. And stat three is interesting in terms of mitochondria because stat three actually localizes to mitochondria. So we're currently looking at the mechanisms that are regulating this change in mitochondria in the cells and outside of the cells in the context of stats and how they're doing that and how they're affecting mitochondrial biogenesis, mitochondrial turnover, um, and fission and fusion dynamics as well. And so the second question that I had mentioned is, are these changes relevant to EOE pathogenesis? So to test that, we use an esophageal organoid system. Before I show you the data, I just wanna mention that we took esophageal epithelial cells from transgenic mice that have floxed alleles of transcription factor A mitochondria or TFAM. TFAM is a transcription factor that's critical for the generation of mitochondrial DNA. Um, so we took these cells from the mice. These did not have any CRE in them. But when we took them in the absence of any exogenous CRE, which I will show you after this, in the absence of CRE, we saw that if we add IL-13, we get a nice phenotype that we consider to be consistent with basal cell hyperplasia. So this is what we expect in a normal esophageal organoid from a mouse, a single layer of basal cells, several layers of differentiated cells, and a nice keratinized core. With IL-13, that squamous differentiation gradient is disrupted and we have more basal cells and not as much evidence of um, squamous differentiation. When we looked at TFAM, again, that critical protein in mitochondrial biogenesis, we saw that there was an increase in TFAM with IL-13 treatment. If we then added Cree through an adenovirus into the culture medium of our organoids, 
we saw that we were not able to fully restore organoids back to their normal phenotype, but there was at least some evidence of squamous differentiation present here. And we can see that um, tamoxifen, I'm sorry, that TFAM was actually very nicely depleted here. And so we do think based on this data that this increase in mitochondria that IL-13 mediates is playing a role in the epithelial remodeling that's occurring in the disease. Finally, we wanted to move in vivo with those TFAM floxed mice. So here we've crossed them with a K5 Crete ERT2 model in which in response to tamoxifen, we are going to deplete TFAM in squamous epithelial cells because um, this is driven by the expression of keratin-5 promoter. So looking at the levels of TFAM expression in our mice without EOE, we do see that with tamoxifen, so when we induce creativity, we are going to have a slight decrease. It is not significant. But there is a decrease in the level of TFAM, which we're looking at in this graph. Um, however, which was more exciting to us was when in, we do see an increase in TFAM in our mice with EOE, and we're using the MC903 over albumin model to induce eosinophilic esophagitis here. But we do see that TFAM goes up in our mice that have evidence of eosinophilic esophagitis. But if we then deplete TFAM, we are seeing, um, if we then add CRE, which is going to deplete TFAM, there is a significant decrease in several of the mice. So suggesting that this model is working. So what happens in terms of the esophageal epithelium? Um, we are just showing a one representative mouse here. Again, these are all mice that are going to have MC903 OVA mediated EOE. And what I hope you can appreciate is that at, in our mice that don't have tamoxifen, so they're going to have TFAM still present, you'll see that there is robust eosinophilia in this particular focus, and you actually have a nice disruption of the esophageal epithelium because of that inflammation. However, in this mouse where we have depleted TFAM, we have much less inflammation and the epithelial barrier is restored. So this is supporting a role, again, for this increase in mitochondria potentially playing a role in EOE pathogenesis in vivo, and it may have to do with both the epithelial barrier, so hoping to, um, when we deplete TFAM, that is going to be restored and potentially limiting inflammation as well. So this is kind of what we were looking at today. We think that in response to EOE inflammatory cues, you have an increase in mitochondria and esophageal epithelial cells. The mechanisms that are regulating this and the contribution to EOE pathogenesis are things that are continually emerging in our lab. So we actually did just receive an R01 grant from the NIDDK to study this. And this is kind of an overview of the grant and where we're going in the future. So one thing that we'd really like to do is tease out the role of STAT3 and STAT6 in regulating mitochondrial increases inside the epithelial cells and also outside of those cells. Um, we'd like to further expand our studies with our um, genetic mice where we can deplete TFAM and determine what is the functional role of mitochondria in both epithelial remodeling and inflammatory signaling. And then the last part of this relates a bit to the um, human data that I showed you in terms of serum and there being an increase in mitochondrial DNA in a subset of our EOE patients. So here we're working really closely with Amanda Muir's group at CHOP to determine whether we could potentially use mito changes in mitochondria as a biomarker. Um, and one thing that we're looking at is the response to dupilumab because that is going to um, impact IL-4 and IL-13 signaling. And so that is where we're at with this project. We're very excited to continue it. We have a lot of open directions. I'm um, happy to hear any feedback that you all might have. Of course, after thanking my lab. So this is a picture of us. Um, I will say this is very much, we're a very collaborative lab. So people have contributed to this project, numerous people that you see here in the image and our collaborators as well. But someone whom I want to point out is Jasmine Jackson, who gave us all our superhero poses. So that was great from her. Um, but Jasmine is also in her fifth year of her PhD. And there's a blow up of Jasmine. She just started her F31, which contributes to this particular project. So she'll be looking for a job in the next year or so. Um, and I just wanted to put that out there for the audience. But with that, I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thanks, Kelly. That was fantastic. It's great to see the follow-up of my own work. Um, 
just wanted to start off with a question and we're going to hit some of the other ones. But, you know, as you probably also know that patients with EOE have what, what's known as mitochondrial apathies. And there's um, evidence for that, on, including on mild muscle biopsies. So I wonder how you put that all together with your observations about the increase in mitochondria in the epithelium. Yeah, so it's something that Amanda and I have been talking about in terms of looking at the patients who come in for mitochondrial diseases. We haven't gone that far down in terms of looking at that, but it's something that we've been toying with. And I do think that it's going to be important to determine. I think in thinking about this as a biomarker in particular, it is also important to know if it's going to be specific for EOE. So if it is um, any changes in mitochondria are related to mitochondrial diseases or potentially either other types of inflammatory disease as well, right? So we are trying to kind of incorporate that into everything that we do, but we don't have an answer for you yet. I have a lot of other questions, but we're going to open it up to some other people. Let me start with this question. How much of the increase in MTCO1 is on a per cell basis versus due to the overall basis on hyperplasia and active EOE, not present in normals of patients in disease remission? I think that's a great question. And Jasmine is working on trying to quantify that, but we we just don't know yet what is um, happening on an individual basis in the cell. So we are actively looking at that in our immunohistochemical seeding, but we're also trying to do flow to look at things on a single cell level and in the context of our um our marker, our dyes that can look at both mitochondrial activity and also the level of mitochondria, but we're not there yet. Thank you. Another question is the serum and mitochondrial DNA high subjects with regard to those, have you done any additional endotyping and or looked at levels of R13 across the entire cohort? We have not, but we do have plans for that. What I can tell you is in collaboration with Marie Pertatro at Northwestern, she has been looking at gene expression in inflammatory versus fibrotic um, phenotypes of EOE. And when we, one of the um, signaling pathways that came up as being most upregulated specifically in the inflammatory condition or mitochondrial associated pathways. So it really might be associated with endotype and it's something that we are considering. All right. Thank you. Are the mitochondrial, uh, is MTCO1 and, and DHTKD1 specific to EOE or are these mitochondrial DNA accumulations also found in other GI diseases? Yeah, so DHTK1 absolutely has been associated with other diseases. MTCO1 is and is not going to be specific to EOE as well. I'm much more familiar with that. So there are papers that have shown that there are changes in mitochondrial DNA, even in the serum of patients with IBD. So there is a study that came out in that respect. But I do think as I mentioned earlier, determining if we're saying something is a biomarker, is it going to be specific is something that is incredibly important. We also are looking, um, our grant actually is allowing us to look at the entire mitochondrial genome. So all of the genes that are encoded there to see if there's actually a panel that might be better than just using one or two mitochondrial genes. So we've looked at five so far, um, but we're going to look at the entire genome. Thank you. Did you look if there are mitochondrial remodeling, is there mitochondrial remodeling, particularly in response to T2 cytokines? And maybe you could tell us what re mitochondrial remodeling is. Yeah. So based on our mito tracker, we thought that there would be robust changes in fusion because we do see that the mitochondria look to be more elongated, but at least at the level of RNA, we've been trying to determine what is happening here. And we didn't see any changes in fission or fusion markers. Now that's RNA. We are trying to follow up this in terms of protein, um, but we are seeing changes in biogenesis, which makes sense because TFAM is playing a role and also mitophagy might be affected. So I can't tell you, I can tell you by looking at the mitotracker DNA, I would assume there is remodeling, but we haven't followed up far enough for me to confirm that. Okay. Um, got a long question here, but it's, um, but you don't have to go into all this. We've got a limited amount of time, but the person wanted to know, Apparently, these are related questions. Um, is the cytokine tissue culture experiments done at physiological levels? Is this real life conditions? Have you considered cytokine combinations to see if there is synergy? In this serum of mtDNA high subjects, is there a correlation with severity, activity, or phenotype of the disease and active AOE to explain the widespread? Good yes. luck with that. 
Uh, so <laughs> say in terms of the cytokines, um, we so this is a question that we get often, and we often get why do we do seven days? Basically, we had seen that there was an increase in MTCO1. Mark, your group had published there was an increase in DHTKD1. So it seems like what we needed to do was find the conditions in vitro in which we could see an increase in mitochondria, right? We want to study that. So we, it took us seven days of treatment and IL-13 was the thing that did it in the cells and IL-4 was the thing that did it outside of the cells. We have gone back and done dose titrations with both IL-4 and IL-13, not the other cytokines yet. So we are working on that because I do I think it's important, as you said, the combinations. One thing that you may have noticed in some of those um, slides that I showed with the mitochondrial DNA in the cells in particular is that TNF-alpha does have an effect on mitochondria, but it's the opposite. It's actually decreased there. So in a patient, you're going to have all of these different cytokines and what is the net effect. And perhaps, you know, in addition to things like the endotype or the severity, it's the inflammatory milieu that's particularly present in that one patient that could be influencing this as well. So we are trying to get more of our mitochondrial DNA data, and then we're going to go through and have statisticians try and correlate that with all of the clinical data that we have, but we just haven't done that yet. Thank you. It's a comment here, which is very inspiring to know that there's a parent on here of a child with EOE, and they find this to be very helpful, and they wanted to know if a mitochondrial working on mitochondrial support would be helpful. Um, I'm just not sure exactly if they mean enhancing mitochondrial function or if um, research support for mitochondrial research um, would be helpful. Either way, um, I'll let you briefly address that. Yeah, so we have been, and this is something that we actually have an RO3 to study um, from NIAID, trying to look at mutations in mitochondrial DNA that are recurrent in EOE patients. So there may be ways to address that. So you can add particular nutrients to restore complex activities and things like that. So it is a kind of route that you could potentially pursue therapeutically, but I think we'd have to know what the changes are. And that's where we're at, looking at what the changes are before we can then come back and target them therapeutically. But I absolutely think it's a future direction that's worth pursuing. I'm going to close the question with one more, which is basically more of a comment, perhaps. But as you know, EOE is inherited and in, in more prevalent in males. And uh, since mitochondria is mainly is from females, only mothers and not from males, obviously there's you know very interesting there biology. But I wonder if somehow it's related where the the absence of the male DNA somehow could be um, pre, a predisposition or, or something like that, or maybe the the mitochondria ultimately is somewhat protective because it's the, the decrease in females. But anyhow, have you thought about that? I So I have thought about it, but I will say it's going a little bit more down the mitochondrial rabbit hole than I am <laughs> actually comfortable with. So if there's anyone on the webinar who is an expert in mitochondria, I would love to talk to you and pick your brain about how we can study that because I do think it's a very interesting question. This is wonderful. Thank you very much. We're now going to turn this, um, the rest of this on back to Dr. Samin Zhang to moderate the last speaker. Thank you again. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Amanda Muir for her talk on the mechanism of tissue remodeling. Uh, Dr. Muir's clinical and research goal is to improve the lives of children with eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease and prevent the devastating consequences of eosinophilic inflammation including weight loss, feeding disorders, dysphagia, and esophageal stricture. Following her training in general pediatrics, her strong foundation in mucosal immunology led to a natural interest in pediatric gastroenterology, in which perturbations in the balance between environmental factors and host innate immune responses have a profound impact upon human growth and development. Among its many complications, disruptions in the esophageal epithelial homeostasis and fibrosis are the most striking histologic features of EOE. And uh, utilizing clinical and basic science techniques, her lab seeks to reestablish tissue homeostasis and halt the damage done in these diseases. Dr. Muir. Amanda, are you there? 
Yes, I am. Thanks. Am I am I successfully sharing? Not right now, but we can now see a video. Okay. It's terrific. You can see it now. Great. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, and thank you so much for the organizers um, and for that wonderful introduction. It's so nice being able to get together and talk about this. And so um, today I'm going to give an overview um, on the the role of uh, or the mechanisms of remodeling in eosinophilic esophagitis and kind of a where are we now in the context of this disease. And um, while there is lots of remodeling that's occurring in the epithelium, which is also very near and dear to my heart, I'm going to be diving below the surface and really thinking about the mechanisms of fibrosis within this disease and the and the fibroblasts themselves. Um, so, just, so fibroblasts at, in homeostasis are quiescent and in the setting of inflammation and injury um, and invading cytokines, the fibroblasts then become activated. And they secrete collagen as well as other extracellular ma matrix proteins. And that all of this leads to stiffness and organ dysfunction, as you can see here uh, with an esophagus that has narrowing and stricture. And so there are critical needs to address fibrosis in the field of EOE. Um, so we need to better understand the pathophysiology of fibrosis in this disease. We need to have better ways of defining fibrosis and diagnosing fibrosis in EOE. Um, and what does it mean to have fibrosis? Is it a symptom? Is it just people with dysphagia? Is it endoscopic, meaning people with rings or stricture? Is it a measurement that we can look at on an endoflip or an upper GI, or is it histologic? And can we look at the amount of condensed lamin appropria? And then finally, another major um, knowledge gap is that we need to better treat this disease in order to prevent fibrosis, and we need to find fibrosis before it even starts. And so generally it is thought that the progression of EOE to fibrosis and stricture occurs over time. And the inflammation generated by Th2 cytokines and the granulocytes leads to tissue damage. And over time, when untreated, there is stricture and fibrosis. And so this explains the phenomenon that adults are more likely than children to pre present with fibrosis. And so we have this paradigm where you get diagnosed with fibrosis and without treatment, you are on an inevitable, an inevitable path or an escalator to fibrosis within years and years of, within years and years of inflammation. And then you develop this stricture. And this was most elegantly shown in um, the work of Elaine Schupfer and colleagues, where they showed that the longer patients had symptoms prior to diagnosis, the more likely they were to present with stricture. And here you can see patients with 10, 20, 30 years of stricture, I mean, 10, 20, 30 years of unchecked inflammation have a very high percentage of stricturing disease. And while um, we, and however, despite all of that evidence with focusing on disease chronicity, we also have to remember that there are patients, patients who show up very early on in life with fibrostenosis. And in this study by Kalis Menard Ketcher and colleagues, they described their population of 40 children who have undergone dilation at their institution in Colorado. And as you can see here, they have a patient as young as four who presented with EOE requiring stricture dilation. And so while chronicity may be an issue, it's not likely the only driver of disease. And investigating this phenomenon more was Elena Klitschkova, who was a postdoc in the Whalen Lab. And um, what she did was she took both young and aged mice and gave them EOE with the same protocol, the oversensitization protocol described earlier. And both, so both groups had EOE for 30 days. And as you can see, both groups with EOE had similar levels of eosinophilia, um, thus demonstrated. And then, however, in the old mice, um, they had much thicker lamina propria compared to the young mice, despite the same duration of disease. You know, thus, we're left with this um, conundrum of chronicity versus um, versus just developing fi fibrosis very early on. And so I think this brings us to one of our first questions um, in the context of fibrosynodic EOE is, is there a fibrosynodic phenotype in EOE where 
patients just come in and have early, early stricture rather than having years and years of disease chronicity. And so we know from other diseases like asthma and inflammatory bowel disease that there are phenotypes in some of these inflammatory diseases. So in inflammatory bowel disease, they have stricturing disease, inflammatory disease, penetrating, stricturing, penetrating. And these phenotypes help to assess with risk stratification and they help with therapy selection. And so it has been postulated that there may be phenotypes in EOE as well. And in this paper, Atkins et al. describes some of the potential ways to classify EOE patients. And in two of these potential classification schemes, um, fibrosis is a key player. And um, so this first one is natural history of disease. So those presenting with fibrosinosis or food impaction that have a stricture. And so do we need to think about how we classify patients? And so how would phenotyping help us in the context of EOE? So we know that the stiff esophagus is harder to treat. And in this study by Aluri and colleagues, they compared topical steroid responders to non-responders. And there were more non-responders who had a history of stricture and dilation. So if we have patients presenting with some narrowing, should we say, let's get this under control fast, heal the tissue, stop the remodeling with more of a top-down medical approach rather than trying um, you know, a, a more conservative um, diet PPI approach. And so knowing that you can, um, you know, <clears throat> knowing that you can stop the inflammation, stop the remodeling, the patient can opt for a different therapy potentially down the road once the inflammation is under control. And so this brings us to our second question, which is, is it just the inflammatory milieu driving fibrosis? And I think the answer to this question is yes, but it's not alone. So the inflammatory milieu might start the process, but it certainly is not acting alone. And so we know that in eosinophilic esophagitis, the inflammatory cytokines from eosinophils and Th2 cytokines, such as TGF-beta and IL-13 are all known to impact fibroblast activation. However, how are these signals, how are signals from the epithelium and the um, underlying matrix also driving this process. And so taking a step back, halting the inflammation does improve fibrosis. So here in this paper by Runge et al, they demonstrate that patients who required an initial, initial dilation at diagnosis, those who have a histologic response as noted by the dotted line, have more dilation-free days than non-responders. So ensuring and striving for remission when possible may decrease the need for future dilation. Um, further, Chang et al. elevated gaps in care. So if patients went years without having any care, they found that those who were had longer gaps were more likely to develop stricture. And more recently in this paper by Alex Strauss, um, we evaluated 100 patients who were first followed early at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and then transitioned to the hospital at the University of Pennsylvania as, an, as adults following these patients for over 10 years. And subjects who were in histologic control of disease were much less likely to have stricture than those without histologic control. So while controlling inflammation is very important, the amount of eosinophils is not likely predictive of fibrosynodic disease. So in this work by Crystal Lynch at the University of Pennsylvania, um, we found that patients with active disease um, have decreased distensibility compared to control patients. However, there was no difference in the distensibility as measured by endoflip between active and inactive patients. So they had similar um, levels of distensibility despite some having their disease under control. And similarly, similarly, there were patients with relatively low eosinophil counts um, who had decreased diameters, as well as those with high eosinophil accounts who have a very distensible esophagus. And so eosinophil count is not necessarily, and the amount of inflammation is not necessarily predictive of how much distensibility there is in the esophagus. And so looking beyond the inflammatory signal, um, we have to think about things. One place we can look is the extracellular matrix itself. And so in this study, um, in this study, Say et al. took fibroblasts from EOE patients 
and isolated the extracellular matrix from those cells. And they plated that plated normal fibroblasts in the EOE extracellular matrix. And they found that these normal fibroblasts had increased collagen, increased smooth muscle actin when they were in the setting of an EOE extracellular matrix. And so there are definitely signals coming from the acellular material that may be driving um, some of this process. And so our group wanted to look at the effects of how stiff the environment was on fibroblast activation. And so how does the stiffness of the environment affect the, the fibroblasts? And so what we did was we utilized a tunable polyacrylamide gel platform in which we varied the amount of bisacrylamide to determine the stiffness of the gel. And we coated the gel with collagen and seeded our fibroblasts on top. And then we have observed morphological changes that occurred over the next four days. And our the gels we made ranged from um, one kilopascal, which is about the stiffness of brain material, um, whereas three kilopascal is probably the stiffness of the intestine, and then up to nine to 12 kilopascals, which is probably more like the stiffness of a stricture. And then we grew them on tissue color, culture plastic. And so... Um, what we found is that the fibroblasts that were seeded on the stiff mate on the soft matrix, the one to three kilopascals, really had no expression of alpha smooth muscle actin. And alpha smooth muscle actin is the signal that the fibroblast is activated. So in the softer environments, the fibroblasts are still quiescent and still asleep. However, when the environment becomes stiffer at nine kilopascals, 12 kilopascals, these fibroblasts are turned on and are expressing alpha smooth muscle actin even without any cytokines added. And so these are, these are fibroblasts that are ready to go despite the fact that there's no inflammation just due to the amount of stiffness in the environment. And then we collaborated with the Hammer Lab over at the, um, in the School of Engineering. And they developed this system where we could seed fibroblasts on microposts. And so I think of these as microscopic beds of nails and varying the length of the post varies the amount of stiffness. So a short post is a stiff post, whereas the longer the posts, it's a much more floppy environment. And so we seeded our fibroblasts in these two different environments, and then we could actually calculate how much the fibroblasts were able to pull the posts and calculate the traction forces from each cell. And what we found was that the traction forces of the fibroblast seeded in a softer environment were much less than the traction forces seeded on the stiffer fibroblast. And so, um, so in this model, the stiff environment really increased the traction force. And so taken together, we have this model where extracellular matrix um, components, as well as the stiffness of the environment are all cues that may be contributing to fibroblast activation and contributing to overall fibrosis. And so then um, we wanted to take a step back and think about what about the epithelium? How is, how is epithelial fibroblast crosstalk contributing to the promotion of fibrosis in EOE? And so Going back to the study I told you about earlier, um, Elena Klochkova um, seeded mouse fibroblasts, just regular fibroblasts with young epithelium and old epithelium and seeded them all in collagen gels and evaluated the, the contractility. And as you can see that those fibroblasts that were seeded with young fibroblasts, young epithelium were much less contractile, had much less contractile behavior than those um, that were seeded with aged epithelium, suggesting that just having older epithelium may influence fibroblast behavior. And then in our group, we were interested in some of the pro-fibrotic signals that may be being expressed in the esophageal epithelium and how um, epithelial fibroblast crosstalk may be contributing to fibrosis. And based on um, much of the sequencing data that has come out, we um, started focusing on an enzyme called lysaloxidase. And lysaloxidase is an enzyme that crosslinks collagen. And it was significantly elevated in the biopsies from active EOE patients. 
And, you know, when we were thinking about it, you know, lysoloxidase is this enzyme that's very closely related to fibrosis, but it's being, it's highly expressed in these biopsies, which are predominantly epithelium. And so we found that curious. And so we, um, utilizing biopsies from active, inactive and control patients, um, we found that indeed, um, lysoloxidase was elevated in the setting of active disease. And it was really upregulated in the epithelium when we performed staining. And then we evaluated LOX expression in the context of symptoms and complications. And so first we looked at patients who had a fibrosynodic appearance on scope, meaning did they have rings or narrowing noted? And lysoloxidase expression was increased in those patients um, who had fibrostenosis, fibrostenotic endoscopy findings compared to those who did not. And similarly, we found that those who had fibrostenotic complications, which we defined as intermittent food impaction or a true food impaction requiring endoscopic removal, we found that the lysoloxidase was higher in those patients as well. And lastly, we evaluated, you know, could we use lysoloxidase um, as a marker to determine who you know, to, to pick out some of these patients who have complications. And um, using a relative fold increase of 5.2, we compared to compared with a healthy control group of EOE as a cutoff point to generate a, we used generated a receiver operating curve. And patients were found to be classified as having fibrosynodic EOE with a 52% sensitivity, but a 79% specificity and an area under the curve of 70, of 0.72. And so, um, this indicates that LOX upregulation, despite the fact it's epithelial, may predict some of the fibrostenotic disease that's happening below the surface. And could it um, have implications for EOE diagnosis and therapies? Um, we also wanted to look deeper into this and figure out what was driving the LOX expression. And so we stimulated our non-transformed, immortalized esophageal epithelial cells, the EPC2H terts that were discussed previously, and with our EOE-relevant cytokines. And we found that IL-4, IL-13, TNF-alpha, and TGF-beta all significantly induced lysoloxidase in these cells. And um, we also performed IHC using our organoid model in order to demonstrate this further. And so kind of thinking about what lysoloxidase is doing. Um, so once the lysoloxidase is produced by the epithelium and is secreted, it becomes extracellular. The collagen, um, so I'm sorry, once collagen, the collagen molecules that are made by the fibroblasts are extracellular, they arrange into fibrils. Um, and within these fibrils, they're... Um, there are cross links that form and lysoloxidase is the enzyme responsible for the, con the condensation reaction that causes these fibrils to form. And so cross linking um, was first linked to tissue stiffness in the context of breast cancer. So um, however, in mammary fibroblasts that had enhanced lysoloxidase were found to have enhanced tissue stiffness. And so when I think about collagen without cross links, I think of it more like being a waterbed, whereas collagen with crosslinks is more like a regular mattress. And so the, the lysoloxidase forming these collagen crosslinks really gives form and stiffness to the esophagus. And so if we can prevent the stiffness from occurring, even if the collagen is already deposited, can we reverse some of the end organ dysfunction we're seeing? And so um, here we have our model where we have our EOE inflammation leading to epithelial LOX production, leading to increased collagen stiffness and cross-linking. And so then um, I think going back to the clinic, you know, how do we define fibrosis in EOE and how do we detect it before um, stricture development? And so this is a major issue in the field. And if um, in order to find patients at risk for developing stricture, we need to be able to have a way to detect it or find a molecule we can look at. And if we could get specimens like this, where we have full thickness, things would be a lot easier. However, this is a mouse with esophagus with EOE. And so we're never going to get a full thickness biopsy that gives us this much information. And so 
And in EOE, we know only about 50% of our biopsies have adequate laminopropria appropriate sampling to even evaluate for fibrosis. So we have to think of other ways to really um, determine who is getting fibrostenotic before they get fibrostenotic. And so one of the tools we've started to use more recently is the functional luminal imaging or FLIP. Um, and with this, we get distensibility, which is a measure of pressure and diameter. And so as you can see, we insert a balloon alongside the, the scope, we remove the scope, and then we very slowly inflate the balloon. And we actually can measure the diameter of the esophagus as the balloon inflates. And we only inflate the balloon to the same amount as a swallow. So we're not dilating the esophagus at all. We're just filling the esophagus and seeing how the esophagus behaves and how much pressure the balloon is um, pushing on the esophagus just at a very normal volume. And so one question is, can we add this type of evaluation to better um, understand um, remodeling in the esophagus? And um, what we really need is a holistic approach to evaluating esophageal function. So kind of looking at all of the tools that we have and maybe using all of our things, our endoscopy, our histology, our flip and our symptoms, maybe then we can come to some way of trying to measure this. And then just thinking about the future, you know, patients with EOE undergo many, many, many scopes. And is there a future where we can have a minimally invasive marker of fibrosis? And I just wanted to give a shout out to one of the studies we did in collaboration with Drs. Ackerman and Menard Ketcher, where we looked, um, we used the esophageal string test, which is a um, a nylon string that sits in the esophagus for an hour. And after you pull it out, you put it in some buffer and send it to the lab and they can look at some of these markers. And we were actually able to correlate um, some of the markers picked up on the string with the esophageal distensibility and with some of the markers of esophageal, of eosinophil, of epithelial mesenchymal transition. And so maybe this string can help us pick up more markers of fibrosis earlier on. And I will end there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that great talk, Dr. Muir. Uh, there's a question in the chat. What is the role of mast cells in fibrosis and EOE? That is a great question. Um, you know, I, and I don't think we have even begun to dive into that at all. Um, you know, we know that any of these granulocytes that are causing damage are probably driving the process but exactly um, what the mast cell granular proteins are doing, I have don't think anyone has looked at that and that's a great, great thing for the future. Thank you. There's another question. Uh, in terms of the fibroblast biophysical studies you showed, particularly related to the stiffness impacting fibroblast remodeling, have you looked at fibroblasts from EOE versus control? Yes, we have. Um, so we have looked at both fibroblasts from EOE and control as well as fibroblasts from pediatric and adult patients to see if there are any differences across the ages. Um, most of the time they behave similarly ex vivo um, for the most part. There are some subtle differences. Col collagen expression increases dramatically with age. So the adult fibroblasts tend to produce much more collagen. Um, but but as far as, you know, when you throw TGF beta on a fibroblast, whether it's an EOE fibroblast or a control fibroblast, they, it has a similar effect. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Rothenberg. Thanks. This has been a wonderful um, webinar today. Very pleased um, to hear about all the progress and uh, want to remind you to um, log into our website, think about becoming a member and provide feedback and also suggestions for future webinars and medical article reviews. I want to thank our sponsors today for this particular webinar, Sanofi and Regeneron, and I wish you a good day.